Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 796. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 21st, 2023. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us, taking time out of your schedule, and we respect that. That's why we only put out one-hour shows. We know that your time is valuable and that, you know, you wouldn't want a two- or three-hour show, but we're going to do one hour twice a week for your enjoyment. So, welcome. Before we get too far into the program, before you really form an opinion about how good this episode is, please like us on YouTube and Facebook. That helps with free advertising and gets word around about uh, Anglican Script. We've actually had a couple viral videos that have gone uh, out as we did some commentary on Asbury uh, revival and um, that was cool we like having uh, a little excessive viewership once in a while um, if you get a chance go to the comment section that's where things are really happen the show really never ends until the comments stop and so if you see something that we're wrong about and you see something that you want to add a story about or inform us about that's where you go and have a conversation in the comments now don't call us names that's that's not helpful even though we probably deserve it at some point but we appreciate you doing so. If you have friends or enemies that you think need to watch Anglican Unscripted, please share this episode with them. You copy the URL and send it off, and they will either be delighted or disappointed in your sharing. George, how are you doing this week? Very fine. Church is getting ready for Easter. We're having a churchwide cleanup this Saturday where we're scrubbing from top to bottom so that when... Palm Sunday week begins, and Holy Week will be all set for a beautiful Easter Sunday. That's great. Now, I people who've never visited uh, Florida in the early spring probably don't realize that this is pollen season here. And so George and I and a lot of residents in Florida, native and, and uh, uh, snowbirds, suffer from that yellow-green stuff all over our cars and driveways. When I go for a bicycle ride over on the, the Withatuchi Trail, uh, my tires are just green by the time I get back. And so that causes George and I to move in slow motion as we do shows in the spring. It's, it, it is what it is. Uh, you don't suffer from allergies, do you, George? Yeah, a little bit, I do. <laughs> <A little> bit. <laughs> uh, but the dog and I have been scratching uh, all through this uh, show prep. Um, it's We have... We're farther north. Uh, when I lived down in Vero Beach, we would have uh, the uh, grapefruit and orange trees. Mm. Their pollen. It's different from the oak pollen that we have here farther north. And so all the different uh, the different tree species uh, give off their pollens at different times of the year. But oak is really the one that gets to me. Yeah, I have a friend who moved to Orlando from uh, Connecticut, and he is allergic to palm trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I mean, that's a bad place to live if you're allergic to palm trees. Let's move on here to the news. Uh, first, I want to say something before we get too far. I, I want you to know that Anglican Unscripted is a safe place. I know in this this woke world, everybody says you're safe to, to come here if you are this and this and that and that. Here, if you are a believing Christian and baptized and, and just want to know more about the news of the day and find people who... Uh, have the God bias, that's George and I, this is it. This is your safe place. We're going to tell you the truth. Um, we're going to tell you the truth on both sides and uh, be as transparent as possible. Understand we both have a God bias, but um, it, as far as talking about the news in the Anglican and Christian world, we're, we're kind of sh straight shooters in that. And uh, it get, it's given us a trusting reputation, but sometimes it's uncomfortable to hear what we have to say. And as such, hey, George, it's the 10th anniversary of Pope Francis and Justin Welby in office. Whoa. Yes, two weeks ago, uh, Francis marked his 10th anniversary, and today is the 10th anniversary of the installation of Justin Welby. Congratulations to both. You know, and now, it, go ahead. Oh, somebody put in the comments, Kevin, stopped interrupting George so much. It's not that we, we both interrupt each other a lot, but in pollen season, if you interrupt somebody, it takes longer for them to recover. So I will stop interrupting George as much, and George will stop interrupting me as much. 
because we can't recover. But if you look back in other videos for 795 episodes, it happens frequently, but we're more likely at our younger age to recover. George, <laughs> on to you. Well, 10 years ago, if you look at the videos that we did at that time, we were quite excited about the advent of Justin Welby. He had a reputation as uh, a, uh, an evangelical. He had a reputation as being a businessman and efficient. And coming off the Rowan William era of a sort of a, a woolly bully professor, a uh, weird beard, sandal wearing vegan pacifist uh, liberal, it, uh, it was nice to have somebody who would bring uh, a sense of order and discipline from a professional standpoint. And we were quickly abused of our hopes. Uh, Justin Welby did not turn out as we had expected. And uh, we held on a lot longer than some other people. Some other people were saying from the very beginning, no, he's not an evangelical. He's He came up through the Holy Trinity HTB network, but he's more of a charismatic than an evangelical. And I really didn't see the distinction there. But now that we're 10 years on, uh, I don't really see him as an evangelical. I see him as a company man driven a lot by emotion, a lot by institutions. And it's, it's difficult to assess him uh, because sometimes we seem to verge on the personal in the criticism uh, because of the style that he's brought. And I get uneasy about that. Well, I that, think that form of criticism. Yeah, I think the Crown Nomination Committee got what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. They wanted somebody who could come in after Rowan Williams and try their very best at all cost, at all cost, to keep the unity and the peace. No matter mm -hmm. where the direction of the, the liberal church was going, no matter what the Episcopal Church had decided to do, or the Anglican Church of Canada, or Scotland, uh, or the Church of England. Whatever decisions that are made in the next 10 years, Justin Welby, we, we hope and pray that this promise you're making to the Crown Nomination Committee to, to keep the peace works. So I think as far as they're concerned, he's doing a fine job. Uh, there hasn't been an, a breakup any officially yet. Um, yes, tensions are strained. The, the fabric is torn. But until uh, uh, the Global South and GAFCON make a... a pronouncement together that uh, they're moving on you know i think uh welby has to the best of his ability maintain that unity uh it doesn't look good from my perspective uh it's not the decisions i would have made um i'm sure george would have made uh, different decisions if he were the archbishop of canterbury but uh you know 10 years on it could have been worse if you could imagine uh, a Catherine Jefferts Shorey as the Archbishop of Canterbury, or Michael Curry, or <laughs> I could I could list five or six uh, uh, bishops from the UK that would have done far worse. I you know I I want to take this as a big standpoint. Has he done good for the church? No. Has he done good for uh, the body of Christ? In my humble opinion, not really. Um, but he, the, I can think of highlights when he goes to South Sudan, when he goes to uh, make uh, introductions and tries to keep the peace internationally outside of the Anglican Communion, he does an okay job. Certainly. I, I think there are some things he will put point to with pride mm -hmm. over his tenure as Archbishop of Canterbury. However, he doesn't seem to be the man for the times. Um, he can be a little tone deaf in the sense that he can't seem to really read uh, the uh, read the room, as Giles Frazier recently put it in an article. He doesn't seem to have the ability to move on his feet quickly, other than to sort of pander to the the audience. He has a bad reputation for saying things that people want to hear when they're with him and then moving on to say not not the opposite but shading his words 
to fit the congregation. So things he would say to a conservative audience, he won't say to a liberal audience, rather. And the what the thing about Rowan Williams, if you compare the two, is Rowan Williams had his strengths and his weaknesses, but Rowan Williams was fairly consistent in his words. Um, he didn't shade things the way Justin Wilby does. Now, that may be part of uh, his Welby's business background of sort of uh, trying to make sure that everybody gets on by saying the things people want to hear, but it's not been helpful for the, for the institution. So in the quest for unity, he's actually driven it farther apart rather than closer together. Mm -hmm. Well, there's that, and when Rowan Williams speaks, you have to really hone on to hone into what the exact message was. He's able to speak at an intellectual level that uh, lay people like myself, you know, about four rungs down the ladder, go, you know, that sounded really good. George, was that good? And George would say, mm -hmm. yeah, that was good. You know, you, you have to look to, to to other people for interpretation. When Justin Welbin speaks, he has more of that lay presence in his, his uh, speaking so that people like me can understand. And I can immediately discern good or bad when uh, Justin Welbin is, is giving a sermon. It's not mm -hmm. that difficult. Where with Rowan, he, he spoke at a more... Uh, theological level than I that I'm prepared to to discern so to speak <laughs> one of those um, so but in a such you know th there's good things that Justin Welby has done in 10 years and things that are just beyond belief but the same could be said about Pope Francis we ha I had okay I had hope in a South American uh, person becoming the Pope and maybe that would bring more uh, um, evangelical presence to the Roman Catholic Church. I am wrong. I can admit it. My hope in Pope Francis and Justin Welby has not served me well, George. Yeah, and really, the we, we speak about the crisis in the Anglican world, and but I think right now with the German potential schism, the Catholic world is facing a crisis just as major and massive for them, Yeah, where Francis is essentially not given his overt support to the moves taken by the German bishops to change uh, church doctrine on marriage and human sexuality, but no, neither has he spoken up to oppose it. So we have two men who seem genuinely to enjoy each other's company. They like each other, just as Benedict and Rowan Williams got along famously, Correct. Yeah, absolutely. both were theologians. Mm -hmm. We have uh, uh, Jorge Bergoglio and Justin Welby seem to get on just wonderfully. Now, what... What? Now... <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> what, is that, what is that telling us? Um, Be string people like each other. It's, it, it is what it is, you know. Um, yes, what is it telling us? But both churches will certainly divide if the course that they're on continues. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I want to use a secular term here that silence is violence. If Pope Francis won't give his opinion on what's happened in the, in the German Roman Catholic Church, it will split. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly because he wouldn't say something. So, uh, I I pray for Justin Welby. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first off, I am conscious. Many a time, I have spoken rather harshly about him, and I feel badly about that because I don't know the man's soul. And I would say that he seeks to do the good. I mm -hmm. will not. I will not say that Justin Welby's a bad man or is, has been, uh, been uh, has uh, malign motives. I don't understand his motives all the time. I disagree with his quest for unity at all costs, but I think he genuinely wants to achieve what he thinks is what God wants, which is unity. I don't agree with that, that that is what God's primary choice is. And sometimes I personally stretch, you know, step into being censorous uh, of the person rather than the 
the actions and I shouldn't do that. So that's, that's my caveat. Having said that, I, I really do not think this is the right man for the job. And I've not, I'm not hopeful that it's going to get any better. Um, because I see where he, I see that he's working from a, a worldview where unity, 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 truth be damned, if you will. Uh, and what it has led to is the greatest disunity that the Anglican world has ever seen. And I don't want to blame Justin for that because I think stuff like the instruments of unity have set this all up for failure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people say we need a Pope in the Anglican church. Certainly not. It, it doesn't mm -hmm. work very well for the Roman Catholics. It wouldn't work for us in any way, shape or form either. Uh, but in as such, there has to be a, de a decision making body. And as far as the Anglican communion is concerned, and it's a nouveau approach. The uh, decision-making bodies are uh, the primates, nah, but they can't talk. Uh, Lambeth, but they don't make any theological decisions. Uh, the AAC, but they can't make any theological decisions. Or the Archbishop of Canterbury, who has decided that he's going to be AWOL when it comes to making hard decisions. It, it, there, it, it's going to fail. Uh, there has to be a, a more um, conductive way to... Uh, hold things together, have accountability, well, is, and uh, set the church for a course for the next five decades. Well, the two most prominent converts from Anglicanism to Catholicism in the last decade, uh, Gavin Ashenden and Michael Nazarelli, raised the exact point that you did, mm -hmm. that there is no magisterium within the Anglican world. There is no place where the buck stops here. Uh, there is in the Catholic world. And, uh, but he is a wall on some certain hot topics. Yeah. Well, now what we have seen is the med when the magisterium uh, is not functioning properly, Catholicism falls into the problems that Anglicans have been driven by over the last 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Where does authority lie? Now, we will have uh, uh, party answers. Authority lies in scripture, lies in the traditions of the church, so on and so forth. And it's good that those fight themselves, fight amongst themselves to sort of uh, keep things sharp. And um, but the we really are in a time when the men who have been placed in these positions of authority just have not been up to the job. Um, okay, so they've done. They've done. They've done ten years. Uh, I would suspect, but don't know or have any idea, uh, that Justin Welby is going to slow down a lot after uh, the crowning of King Charles. That that's that's going to be his uh, uh, optic, his you know his opus, and I've done it, good, all done, lots of pictures, and I, I will be known for the the Archbishop who crowned the new king. And then I would imagine he's going to slow down and maybe uh, uh, seek to step down as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Pope Francis has also said, my health is starting to wane on me. Uh, you see most of his pictures now. He's wheelchair bound. And he says, I don't want to serve as a pope if my health uh, is bad. So are we now into the next couple of years where we're going to be choosing a new Archbishop of Canterbury and a new pope? That's, that is a major question that nobody can answer except the two involved men. Yeah. Justin Welby is, uh, has said that he's going to stay till retirement age of 70, I believe. And, but then again, there has been a lot of speculation that once he does the uh, coronation, he will do, as you say, sort of start to coast because the other problems he has are not, resolvable in the way things are right now and he'll leave it for the next fellow but we don't know we don't yeah. know and francis has hinted that he too might retire and do a do what uh, benedict did but we don't know well you you just said retire and you said next fellow there's plenty of uh, female bishops in the church of england now 
Uh, who would be a leading female candidate for next Archbishop of Canterbury? Uh, the Bishop of London, Sarah London, Mullally. Actually. Yeah. Um, that would be, in my view, an utter fiasco, not well, because yeah, she's but... a woman, <laughs> but because of her competence. Uh, yeah. She is, if you will, well be in a minor key, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so, so it would be uh, same old, same old, yes. <laughs> so, uh, but there you go. Yeah, cool. Uh, All right. So on to other news. GAFCON 4 is just around the corner and uh, you're going and you're going to serve as a, a reporter for Anglican Inc., Anglican TV, and Anglican Unscripted. We'll be doing uh, hopefully frequent uh uh, interviews and broadcasts from there. Uh, you got your ticket? Got Held your passport? Ticket? Your visa? Yeah. yeah. Good to go. All, All set. right. So what are the expectations for GAFCON 4? I've seen some videos with Ben Kashi. I've seen a couple articles back and forth. Um, this is going to be the fourth. We're at, what, three years, four, that's 12 years now we've been doing GAFCON. I see areas where GAFCON is truly mature. GAFCON clearly does not need uh, or have anything to do or a desire to do anything with Canterbury. Hmm. Uh, and that, that's, that's maturity. GAFCON as an, as an institution is evolving. Now, three or four days before the start of GAFCON, there will be a meeting of primates. And it, I think some of the Global South primates will be attending that as well. I don't want to say it's a meeting of the two groups because there's a lot of overlap. So before the start of the GAFCON meeting, we're going to have a, a mini primates meeting that's closed, of course, and they're not really talking about it, but people are aware that it's going to take place. And out of that meeting will come a steer, I believe, to the future of GAFCON and the Global South and the traditionalist movement. Um, the, global, the Global South primates on their own are going to have a follow-up to their... Uh, Ash Wednesday statement, where uh, Justin Badiarama of South Sudan gave uh, sort of the uh, word to the conservatives in the Church of England that we have your back. Now, I haven't explained how that exactly is going to take place because the uh, English scene is not the American scene. In other words, uh, a, a Church of England parish can't just pull out of the Church of England and take its nope. property with it or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So they're going to get a little more specific in how they can go forward. And where I see GAFCON moving is prior GAFCON meetings had, for instance, the Anglican Church in North America or the Anglican Mission in England as sort of their focuses. We don't have this this time around. We now, but so, because we've seen GAFCON evolving into more of an evangelistic or a more of a faith and institution building entity rather than a political uh, association. Lambeth, in the sense of Canterbury and the whole movement, is becoming irrelevant in the GAFCON eyes, still relevant in the Global South eyes. Now, these are very strong statements, but... I, you know, if you look at what the agenda is and where things are going, we're going to be praying, we're going to be doing talks about, uh, listening to talks about the work being done, about network building and things of that nature. So it's not so much, uh, we're doing this, but Canterbury and Welby is doing that. It's more of a, here's how we see ourselves moving forward in the future in fellowship and in faith. So, but again, we'll see that we'll have a steer from the primates at the very beginning to sort of give us a sense of which way we're jumping. Now, which way we're jumping, clearly the last Lambeth is going to have a big effect on uh, both the Global South and GAFCON, and it would be really co uh, really nice if they could work together from now on um, in their statements and stuff like that. But the recent news out of the Church of England with the LLF, Living, Love, and Faith statements and uh, trajectory should be the most unifying uh, piece of news that GAFCON and the Global South have heard. 
You know, that, that, should, that, that, that should give you a clear idea of where the Church of England is, where the Church of England is going, and the leadership role that the Archbishop of Canterbury has chosen to be a person who will not conduct blessings, but fully supports them. A person who fully uh, supports the blessing of gay weddings, but won't conduct them himself. Well, the Bible set, identifies that type of person, and the New Testament is not kind in its identification of that type of person, especially if they're the Archbishop of Canterbury, George. Well, this GAFCON meeting and the subsequent Global South meetings are going to define what they think is happening in the Church of England. Because I don't even think the Church of England knows what's happening in the Church of England. Um, because this... This, this recent vote to authorize gay, uh, gay blessings and pastoral work and all that, that has to come back to the Synod in July. And the Church of England's bishops can basically take a number of courses. They can basically say, okay, we've seen the reaction, we've seen the response, we've seen these parishes in England saying, no, we're gonna cut out the money. Oops, we made a mistake. And we need to go back to the drawing boards. We could, or all the way to, well, it's a done deal. It's just now going to dot the I's and cross the T's. And the trajectory is towards gay blessings and towards full inclusion, sort of what Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, has been saying. Mm -hmm. There is no firmness where on this spectrum of uh, where they're going to wind up. Um, Andrew Goddard, writing on the Fulcrum website, has uh, basically laid out a number of scenarios where, and he's got basically four scenarios of uh, starting over, uh, putting more time into what exactly are we saying, how do we, how do, right now the, the bishops in England are saying, we're going to have gay blessings, but it's not going to change doctrine. But we're not explaining how that's going to happen. We've not done any of the work to explain how why, you know, how this unicorn is going to be uh, uh, corralled. And instead, the sort of impression is that, well, we're just not going to answer these questions. We're just going to do it. And over the next 10, 15 years, we'll figure out how we've gotten to this place and sort of have backwards uh, justification. GAFCON and the Global South are watching this as institutions, and they're coming to the conclusion that it, it is a done deal. Now, will this be a case of GAFCON, of the observer defining things for the Church of England? If the, if the opposition says, you guys have already gone over the edge, will the people in the Church of England well be say, well, we might as well go over the edge because that's what we're being accused of doing. Right. Or are we going to pull back before it's too late? Uh, because what's happening now is the evangelical and traditionalist Anglo-Catholic world, is there's real concern about what's happening with the Church of England. You have these major parishes, and as well as many smaller ones, saying, we cannot go along with what's being done, but the way we're structured... We don't know how to jump. So it's it's not comparable to the American situation where a parish could go into the ACNA or a diocese go into the ACNA. Um, like my situation, uh, my situation in Florida is more closely allied to most, to I think the English scene in the sense that I'm out, but I'm in. I'm a member of the Episcopal Church in good standing, we're this and that, but I'm sort of emotionally detached from it. Now, that's an unsatisfactory way forward, but I right. think for many of the English evangelicals, that's what they're going to have to do until they get a better sense. Can we have a third province? Can we have, is there a way to have a divorce? Because, you know, from their pensions to their properties, they are totally controlled by the national church. Whereas here in America, my property is owned by the parish and my salary is paid by the parish and my pension is uh, 
pay to an independent corporation in New York that can't be touched because of the pension laws. So it's there. I've just muddied the waters even further. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry. It's great. Well, here, muddy the waters. Uh, uh, here we have Stuart Bell is consecrated uh, for Wales. Uh, this is another uh, GAFCON uh, bishop, AMIE bishop. And, you know, as we talk about the maturity of uh, GAFCON moving on, they, they seem to be consecrating more and more people, uh, certainly in Europe. Yeah, at Anglican Network in Europe has just consecrated Stuart Bell for their mm -hmm. bishop in Wales. Bell is a very, very well thought of uh, former church in Wales uh, minister. This follows the consecration of somebody for Scotland and also for England. So there is movement and there are people ready to jump and they can jump safely into this Anglican Network. Um, the problem is again the structures. Uh, what can they? Who can they jump with? Uh, so, do I? How should I say this? I think the momentum is in favor of the ANIE and the GAFCON movement in England and in Europe. What is holding it back are the institutional hurdles now so what th there's going to be there's got to be a lot more pain i hate to put it in that way no it, but that's true we here we had the pain of catherine jeffert shorey sending out letters to 770 priests saying oh by the way you're fired yeah okay that we don't have that exact pain going on yet in the church of england because they don't need to. We have you uh, hooked into the Church of England. Uh, we give you the authority to uh, have a uh, license to officiate, or we can take it away. We provide the church where you uh, officiate, or we take it away. You know, it, it's all self-contained. With It's a self-contained entity, the Church of England. Mm. There's got When I say there's got to be a lot of more pain, pain for those people like the English equivalent of the Georges, who uh, are in but out. They're either going to be kicked out, there's only either go, be a great, another great ejection going back to the 17th century when the Puritans were kicked out of the Church of England. There's either going to, that's either going to happen, or things are going to become so difficult and the money's going to become so tight that the Church of England finally breaks down and gives a third province where they do have independence from the, uh, a third province where they're not under these bad bishops or they're not tied in. Um, people have long rejected the idea that, oh, they'll never give in to a third province movement. But things are getting so bad financially and things are getting so bad uh, politically that, uh, this a, a grand compromise that would give an independent province with another archbishop and co you know congregations under a good bishop that is not their local diocesan bishop that may be the way forward but we're going to have to have more pain people are going to have to bleed i hate to say that <laughs> especially until when we reach that point. Yeah. yeah oh boy so Let's, uh, we're trying to expand the program. Yes, we cover Anglican news and Christian news. We also are going to start to cover uh, pagan cultist news. Okay, and so the next story, we post it. This is a story on Anglican Inc. Let me pull it up here so you can all see it. But uh, in pagan cultist news, hold on, give me a second, bring it on over. Boom! The great priestess known as Greta Thornburg, is going to receive a doctorate, honorary, of course, uh, from the theology, from the Faculty of Theology at the University of Helsinki. Holy cow, George, that's just amazing news that we can honor uh, ladies such as Greta Thornburg through theology. I... I didn't know what to do when I came across this. It was a press release from the University of Helsinki. 
Uh, this is the time of year when people start announcing who's going to get honorary degrees at the at the universities and and Greta Thornburg's getting one from the Lutheran faculty at the University of Helsinki's. She's going to be a doctor of divinity at 20 years of age. She's going to be a DD. Oh, maybe I'm being jealous. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, uh, I, 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 I should Google my name to see if I'm getting one. Probably not. But, uh, you know, it's... Um, but the th thing is, Kevin, you know, we've been joking that cl this, for, the, for the extremists, climate change has become a religion. Now, it really has become a religion <laughs> where their high priestess is getting honorary doctorates from theology faculties as if she were the Dalai Lama or something yeah. for, her the for her work in uh, spirituality and theology. Uh, she's not getting a doctorate from the School of Environmental Studies or the Faculty of uh, Forestry, you know, something related to environmental. She's getting it from the theology faculty. What is this telling us? Well, what tells us about the University of Helsinki that the, the Finns, they're uh, getting wild, but uh, oh well, my goodness. I mean, we have to live into this reality that um, the worship of the earth and concern for the earth is really nothing new. Uh, when I was a, a child in the 70s, it was acid rain that was going to to kill me. Um, it, it is what it is. And uh, th there's a famous, uh, is it a poem? Uh, just a, a famous uh, uh, ch children's fa fable uh, about a uh, something that uh, looks at the sky and it says the sky is call falling. Um, Chicken Little, is this the uh, That's poem? That's it. Yeah. yeah. So oh. it, it, it's going to continue on. Uh, they now have bigger microphones. They now have money uh, because they keep us scared. And uh, uh, they, they do a fine job of taking over educations. And uh, kids now from K to 12 learn, live in fear that this earth will implode in the next uh, couple of years because of climate change and that the the oceans will rise and the glaciers will melt and um it's a it's a cult of fear and it, well, all cults are fear aren't they well, you, know. you know and and the churches have gotten well the lambeth conference spent so much time on the environment mm -hmm. and you know no time on the issue uh You've got to say, well, if 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 you look at the councils of the church, what they talk about, they're not talking about uh, issues of faith and morals. They're talking about climate change and mosquito yeah. nets. And so, why shouldn't Greta Thunberg get a doctor of divinity if this is the sort of stuff our bishops are busy talking about all the time? And she probably has more theological understanding than most of the bishops in that province just saying george we should move on and talk about something else besides pagan cultists uh oh <laughs> great transition jewish extremists over in israel are going after the christians yeah this is a worrying some trend uh around christmas time we had the report of uh, two uh, jewish teenagers uh uh vandalizing the Protestant cemetery belonging to Christ Church Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Recently, we had a uh, Jewish man from New York uh, destroy one of the stations of the cross on the Via Della Rosa that pilgrims follow to yeah. recount Jesus's walk to crucifixion. And uh, yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, Sunday, uh, two Jewish extremists uh, vandalized, attacked uh, the, a bishop Greek Orthodox bishops celebrating a service at the Church of the Gethsemane, Church of Gethsemane, uh, where Mary's tomb is located in the Kidron Valley uh, in Jerusalem, um, where they specifically were attacking it because it was a Christian site. Now, Muslim extremists have long been seeking, you know, uh, attacking Christian sites. And a few years ago, we had that seizure of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre by Muslim terrorists and a uh, hostage situation. But now the poor Christian minority in Israel are getting it in both directions, from extremist Muslims and extremist Jews. And I don't know what's driving 
this latest uh, extremism. Um, yeah, it's not common, and I don't understand it either. Every time I've traveled to uh, the Middle East or uh, um, Israel or Jerusalem, I've been told that you are relatively safe because the extremist Jews and the extremist uh, um, uh, Muslims like your tourist dollar more than uh, any effect a, uh, an attack on you or making you a victim would have. And I think that has kept the peace uh, to a certain extent is that tourist dollar. You know, they don't well, want there to, was an to incident scare the away the tourist. Yeah. There was an incident the other day where uh, a carload of German tourists uh, drove a car with Israeli plates by accident into Nablus in the West Bank and the car was mobbed and they were almost murdered, I think yeah. because the people in Nablus thought they were Israelis um, and they were just German tourists. I think the knee socks and sandals might have given them away, but uh, um, it looks like we're starting another round of bad behavior. But this time around, it seems to be coming from both sides, uh, the, the, the crazies on both sides. And I just hope they don't drag everybody down with them. Yeah. yeah I'll have to see. Uh, one final story we got here. Let me go pull it up on my little uh, item thing. Uh, okay. So this is a hard one to explain, but there's a member of parliament uh, in the UK named Ben Br Branshaw. And he wants to force the Church of England to conduct gay weddings because they are a state church. And they serve Parliament. And he believes that uh, he can pass a bill or present a bill that uh, would be adopted where the Church of England would be forced to do gay blessings and gay weddings, George. Yes, this is a private member's motion, a bill mm -hmm. put forward by Brad Branshaw, uh, a, a member of Parliament, I believe, from Exeter. And he has support from both Labour and Conservative MPs. This is not merely a liberal push in the sense of liberal uh, po political party. And they are seeking to compel the Church of England to adopt gay marriage. Now, the Church of England, the Parliament has devolved authority to govern the Church of England to the General Synod of the Church of England. So people are shouting, well, you can't do this. Well, Parliament can give, Parliament can take. Parliament does seek to compel, then the Church of England must follow suit because it is an established church. It is established and is run by the state. It's going to happen, most unlikely. Uh, the government doesn't have the time nor the, uh, the willpower because this will essentially be a fight that will lead to either disestablishment or the independence of the church from the state and to do that before the coronation untying everything untying the relationship between the church and the state would just take so many years uh, of parliamentary time that it's not worth their efforts uh, but at the same time this is a significant poke in the eye to poor Justin Welby because not only does he have the GAFCON and the Global South people attacking him externally, and he has uh, the evangelical parishes walking out internally, and the gay activists saying, you've not gone far enough. He now has the uh, firebrands in the parliament saying, you've got to do what we think is right. Um, this poor guy can't get get a break either way well he's guilty of silence as violence too he has not responded to the drag queen situation uh not pu publicly uh pope francis has not uh responded to the german roman catholic church certainly not publicly and if you're not gonna if you're not gonna raise the issue uh, there's gonna be a power vacuum and it'd be a great place for others to stand in including the British government. So you have to see what happens. George, that's all we have for stories. <gasps> oh, we're going to give our listeners a break. They can get off early, do their homework. Uh, it's tea time. That's what it is. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 796 of Anglican 
Unscripted.